we've now come to the crux of Hunter's argument, which you can see in this last reading, where in particular uh, he doesn't really deal so much with the Christian right and the Christian left, but what he would call the extremism of the Anabaptist tradition. That's the basis from which he wants to construct his own uh, faithful presence theology. In other words, he does it uh, in two ways. He does it negatively against the Anabaptist tradition, and then he does it positively by trying to establish it on the basis of the Incarnation in respect to the restoration of all creation. Uh, I'll give you uh, two quotes, I think, which sum this up. One is the, uh, these are on pages 234 and 230. The world has no spiritual significance outside of its enactments of church life. Now, that's not his position. That's the position that he is claiming that the Anabaptists hold, and he wants to argue against that. Uh, in a positive way, and what he wants to argue, is that Christians live towards the well-being of others. Now, that's interpreted in a very generic sense. Uh, in the way that, uh, for example, in the, in the Reformed tradition, there's a notion of common blessings, which Hunter refers to. And the common blessings, there's sort of two kinds of blessings in the Christian world, and that is the uh, common blessings that's given to everyone. Those are such things as this rain and the sun being given to us, uh, meaning, purpose in life, in marriage, and having a career, and having professions, everybody, whether they're Christian or not, has those blessings. They're common to all of us. But the special blessings that are only given to those in Jesus Christ come from acceptance of Jesus' death on the cross. So you might say, in, in some ways, uh, the, Christ, the special blessings are available and the common blessings are available to Christians. But to people who aren't Christians, then the blessings that are available to them are the common blessings. And it's this sort of marriage that um, Hunter wants to bring together. And in doing that, he then uh, sets up this divide whereby the Anabaptist tradition wants to focus in upon the spiritual blessings, i.e. manifest in the political entity known as the church, uh, and really push aside the notions of the common blessings as something that is uh, entirely, uh, somewhat irrelevant. You know, uh, look, look at uh, Hunter's quote. The world has no spiritual significance outside of its enactments in church life, or of church life. Uh, is now, now, people like, like Halwas would completely disagree with that, and say that he's, he's minimizing what Christian involvement is in the world. Um, uh, but Halwas is drawing a line, and so is Hunter. The line that Hunter's wants to draw, which he establishes theologically from round about page 40, is the enactment of God's word within the world. Whereas for uh, the Anabaptists, Hunter sees that the enactment of God's word in the world takes a particular form of negation so that Essentially, it's, it's a world-hating paradigm. There's no notion of, for example, the way that... I'll give you the one example which he brings up. is the idea of vocation. That for the Anabaptists, the idea of vocation essentially comes down to um, uh, discipleship to Jesus within the context of the body of the church. And um, then the idea of work is something that is a result of the fall of uh, humanity, which means that we have to work uh, for the basis of establishing our living. And according to Hunter, is peripheral in respect to our true vocation, which is in the church. Now, can you say that's true from looking at passages that talk about work in uh, Ephesians and in Colossians uh, and in uh, First Peter in respect to the, the, that work is, is something that you honour as working for the Lord? Now, 
how I was supposed to put that in the context of the church, but the church is in the world, not to change the world, but to actually witness to what Christ has done in the lives of the people who are working. And so from that standpoint, the service in vocation is a service towards which one's needs are met, but it's primarily a vocation in respect to discipleship. Whereas um, Hunter wants to actually uh, widen that notion and even use the words uh, like uh, on 263, he talks about the covenantal character. And when he talks about the covenant there, he's not just simply talking about the special revelation that comes through Jesus Christ, I believe. I think what he's doing there is combining the two elements of the um, common blessing and the spiritual blessings so that the covenantal character of the work of Christians involves also some form of unity with unbelievers. Um, <clears throat> and therefore that when one is working in the world, then that person has a vocation that comes from God and is part of the, uh, uh, the way that creation itself is being reconstituted through Christ, which takes us back to Genesis 1.26. So that then the supervision of creation is given over to Christians to work with non-Christians. And as we work with non-Christians, we bring about the betterment of society. And those are all the vignettes, which are really, really quite useful. I like the, I like the um, uh, explicit nature of those vignettes, the practicality of it, the ones that are given uh, on uh, page. Oh, I've forgotten the page that it's on. Oh, two six six. Yeah, uh, the idea of um, bringing the 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 car dealership that actually provided a way in which low income people could actually buy cars from a dealership that was catering to a very, uh, what you might call, uh, upper middle class people and so forth. All this he sees as being very, very um, worthwhile. It's part of the element of uh, being salt within the community, within society. And he grounds it in that scripture, which I'll read from Jeremiah 29, uh, on page 276. I think this is important. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now, essentially, then, that's, that's the paradigm that Hunter wants to set up in respect to how we approach social justice. And, of course, there's a number of assumptions that are involved in that. Number one, we've lost the culture war. We, I say, uh, Christians have lost the culture war. And therefore, uh, the best way to uh, regroup and establish a faithful identity, which will lead to a faithful presence, is to... Um, uh, uh, regroup within uh, the context of being exiled within the modernist and postmodern culture and seek within that context then to establish your own integrity by uh, building your uh, practical uh, theological uh, uh, activities, um, uh, events, ways of looking at the world in conjunction with how you approach the society that you're in. So as uh, God told the Jews in Babylon in exile to basically seek the welfare of the city. He didn't mean intermarrying with the Babylonians in that text. It meant marry your own people, Jewish people, but work for the welfare of the city there because that's where you are in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the country and God will bless them uh, as, they, uh, as they bless the people in the, in the community. Now, he wants to use that as a paradigm. You have to ask yourself whether that's a good paradigm. Is it a good paradigm in the way that the church was established and what you've seen in the book of Acts? Because essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a removal, it's a negation. Uh, in fact, he accuses people like Hawass and the Anabaptists of being very negative in their theology. 
But that paradigm is a fairly negative one too, because it basically says you're in exile. It basically says that you, you basically have to lick your wounds and regroup. Seek the welfare of the city and I'll bring you back. Um, what's the difference between that and saying we've lost the culture war, but we are not going to regroup according to a, a sort of a, 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 a means of disenfranchising ourselves from the culture and seek the betterment of the culture, but rather we're going to regroup in such a way that we find our identity, and identity is found within the context of the kingdom of God, of who we are, a citizenship from heaven. And from that standpoint, we will become again what we have to um, uh, mold and fashion ourselves uh, into from the inception of the church for the first 300 years. Now, having said that, you can obviously see my perspective, where I'm coming from, out of that. It's not a question of, of imagine the first 300 years of the church, we're not in a position to regroup, they're in a position to go out and establish themselves in the culture that they have got. Now, now it's, it's a different situation now, obviously in the 21st century, where Christianity is uh, in the West uh, on the wane. Uh, is it the best policy to adopt what, what uh, Hunter is saying and seek the welfare of the city by then becoming uh, uh, friends, so to speak, with the uh, events, institutions, practices of what's going on within our uh, national and local communities from the standpoint of seeking their betterment? Or is that uh, inimical to what it means to be in uh, the kingdom of God. And there's probably two different ways you can look at this. Uh, for example, you could look at a community and say, well, what does this community, um, what does it want? Well, it wants the poor to be looked after and so forth. It wants uh, um, people who are addicts to receive uh, treatment and we want good health care, we want a good solid police force and so on. So the Christians get behind that to do that and help the community to work like that. If that's the case, then the community prospers and Christians prosper. Now they prosper, but in what sense? Is it really for the community engagement, for the betterment of the community, or is it that the Christians uh, do this in such a way to... Um, to I was thinking of the word exonerate, but that's not the right word. Um, to um, manifest, to manifest their identity as followers of Jesus, which will attract others to that um, uh, fellowship. Because essentially, at the end of the day, if the world is made a better place, but people still exist within the confines of common grace that God has given them, and have not accepted or come to terms with um, the uh, special graces of Jesus Christ, then to some degree you, can't, you can argue, in fact not to some degree, perhaps ultimately or to the great degree, that it's not been worthwhile. If low-income people in that particular first vignette that uh, hunter users are in a position where they can get cars and so forth, they're driving cars and it really lifts up that community but the people don't reach a position where they can't contact and have communication with the fellowship with the church on its own terms but rather what the church is doing as a social justice element within society then has the church been faithful to its its lord from that standpoint it, it's it's a bit like a seesaw here how far do you go one way you go one way in terms of, for example, John MacArthur's uh, Grace Community Church in Los Angeles, where, where on, the only thing that you're about you're to do in the church is to preach the gospel. That's what the church does. That's part of that argument that uh, Al Mola was giving that I gave you a few weeks ago with the debate you looked at. Uh, as opposed to the other side of that, then, is to be involved with the uh, issues in society, uh, in the issues that were, where you work from the standpoint of uh, bringing uh, what you might call uh, uh, an element of justice within the community that is respected and upheld by unbelievers. So you're better working for the betterment of that community. 
what Halas would say from that standpoint is, is it's oil and water, you can't mix them. You can't mix them because essentially, if you go into the sort of social and political sphere thinking that you can meet the world on its own terms to have influence, that, uh, and it, it, the example he uses is Christian um, uh, politicians, which I think he would see as something as an oxymoron on a, on a national level. In other words, that the, the, this also comes down to what um, Hunter has talked throughout this whole book, which is the notion of power. What is the power that we are um, we, that we advocate? If we move into the social and political realm where where power is used from the standpoint of coercion, then we negate our um, our stance of who we are. And Haras's point is that essentially, whenever there's a conflict between a, a, with a Christian politician and the ways of the world, which are against uh, Christ's uh, mandates, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, then the politician will always come down on the ways of the world. It's a totalitarian response, because that's where the votes lie. That's what will keep him or her within the context of community, the wider community, so that the common blessings, if I can go back to that argument, actually outweigh, in some sense, this the spiritual blessings, and that's, that's a question of a seesaw of, of, of where do you go? You can see where I'm going with this, whereas my th focus is primarily upon the, the element of um, the place of the church uh, as the basis from which everything theologically, socially, in respect to justice must be practiced to assist people to come to know Jesus Christ and from that standpoint, then, all social justice is to bring about good, but it's to, it's to do two things, to witness to Jesus Christ, to the world, and to give people an opportunity in which they can accept Christ. And, of course, that, what I'm saying is the danger, it, on, from one standpoint, is you can play the social justice game, if I can use that in a very positive sense, without recourse to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, as the um, uh, fruition or proclamation element of um, that, um, that guise. So anyway, I'll leave it there for the moment.